Hello everyone, this is Ms. Smith, and the purpose of this video is to talk about resumes and cover letters. Now, full disclosure, this is my third time recording this video because I've had some technical difficulties happen, um, but hopefully the third time is the charm. Okay, so we're going to talk about several things regarding the resume, and we're also going to talk about the cover letter. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. And so, like with the other video, I'm not using a PowerPoint this time. I'm using our ebook version. And so, <clears throat> I'm going to actually start here with preparing a resume. So first of all, I'm not going to assume that everybody knows what we mean by resume. Sometimes there are words that are just kind of flown around our heads all our lives and we really don't know what it is. So let's start there. A resume is a document that you create to market yourself to prospective employers. Okay? A resume is a document you create to market yourself to prospective employers. Okay? So you want your resume document to be a really good snapshot, a really good persuasive argument for you as that potential job candidate. And in doing so, you want to make sure that you're creating your resume so that you can demonstrate through your wording through how your resume is presented, um, that you are the best possible candidate for the job you're going after. Okay? And so that's the idea of a resume. Now the goal, the ultimate goal of the resume is to help you land the job. Right? But a step before that is to help you get an interview. Okay? And so your resume should hopefully help you get an interview um, and hopefully that interview will help you land that job. Okay, and so the book talks about preparing a resume and it gives some really good information about preparing a resume. Um, you want to make sure that you do your homework, um, that you know what your skills and your strengths are, um, and that you know the type of job that you should be applying for. You don't want to overreach and apply for a job that you're actually not qualified for, and you don't want to limit yourself and apply for a job that um, you are overqualified for, right? You don't want to apply for something that you know that you can't meet the requirements for and you don't want to um, apply for something that you're very much overqualified for. So you want to find the right fit for you. And this week what we're going to do is we're going to look for a job. I want you to find a job anywhere in the world. Um, the only requirement is that you are qualified to perform that job, right? You are a qualified candidate for that job. And so it doesn't matter where on earth it is um, because you're actually not going to apply to it. You're just going to use that job search to help you prepare a resume um, that will meet the needs of that job description and to craft a cover letter that also responds to that job description, that job posting. Okay? So I'll say that again. As a part of your jobs packet assignment, you have to find a job, right? So you're going to search for a job. It could be anywhere in the world. You just have to be qualified for it. So let's say you are just starting out at OC Tech and you're a business student, okay? Um, at this point in time, you probably haven't had a whole lot of business courses. And so you don't want to apply for something that would require that you have an associate's degree because you're not at that point yet. However, let's say this is your last semester before you do finish all of your coursework here at OC Tech and you're a business student, okay? Of course you're going to be looking at the job market and trying to find a job in your field. And so it's perfectly fine for you to look for something that will be in your field um, and that may require an associate's degree for the purposes of this assignment because you're very close to that, okay? You're very close to that point in time. And so make sure that you're looking for something that's relevant. If you have been working, for example, in hospitality for several years, you may want to look for a job in hospitality for the purposes of this assignment. Again, I am looking to see if you can take a job posting where the employer has listed exactly what he or she is looking for in a job candidate and if you can craft your resume and your cover letter to show that you know what I'm the best candidate I have what you're looking for you should consider me okay and so that's where we're going with this and so let's look at a couple of other things that the book mentions okay we're just going to hit on some of the high points. Um, what employers like to see in a resume. This is good information, right? And it's common sense information, but it's good to be reminded nonetheless. And so employers want to know that you're honest, right? That you're being truthful about your qualifications and your skills and your education. You're not embellishing or exaggerating or falsifying information. 
They want a resume that looks good. They want the document to be attractive. If your document looks cluttered, if you're using several different types of fonts and they're not working well together, um, if it just looks messy and unorganized, it's not going to reflect well on you and your credibility will go down. Okay? The prospective employer expects you to create a resume that looks good. They want a resume that is carefully organized, that goes without saying, and the book gives us an example here, but we'll just keep scrolling through that. They want you to be concise. They want you to remember that you're not telling your life story, okay? You are getting to the point in your resume, okay? You want to generally keep your resume to one page, um, and you want to make sure that you are hitting those high points. In a resume, you're typically not going to talk in complete sentences. You're going to use phrases, and you're going to use action verbs a lot, okay? So the book gives us more of a full list of action verbs. Be sure you look at that, because you want to begin with those action verbs a lot of times. And so, for example, instead of saying, um, I, um, let's see, I was in charge of um, the fundraiser for my job, just for example, okay? A better word to begin with is organized. So you could say organize the annual fundraiser to raise money for breast cancer awareness. You want to start with that action verb, okay? And so that's important. Um, they want to make sure that your resume is accurate. A resume and a cover letter is definitely not the place to make a typo. You want to go through these documents with a fine tooth comb to make sure your spelling, um, your grammar, your titles, your names, your dates, all of that is accurate. Okay? You want this document to be on point. It needs to be current. It needs to be relevant. Again, you need to make sure that you're applying for a job that you are qualified for. And it should be quantifiable, right? You want to be able to measure your accomplishments. You don't want to just say that I increase sales. You want to say by what percentage you increase sales, okay? You don't want to just say that I increased the likes on our Facebook page while I was the social media manager. You want to kind of give a number, a range, right? You want to quantify that so that it's measurable, okay? And so let's look at a couple of other things regarding the resume. Um, there, the book talks about the process of writing your resume that is helpful. I want to talk about the parts of a resume, okay? And so everybody may have a different take on this, right? There's some things that are standard, this is true, but then a lot of the sections tend not to be, right? They're kind of open for interpretation, um, and so different resumes will include different sections but the contact information section at the top is always going to be there all right that is where you place your name usually prominently maybe in a larger size or a larger type um, you place your name at the top of the page and your contact information you don't want to use a nickname and you want to use your full address you want to use your telephone number and you want to use your email address if you have a LinkedIn profile, like the book talks about LinkedIn. Um, if you have a LinkedIn profile and it's up to date and you have a good profile picture there and you're active in that in that um, networking system, you can include your LinkedIn um, information as well, okay? Um, but you really want to include the basics, right? You want to make sure you have your first and last name, your full address, your zip code, your telephone number, and your email address, okay? And so that contact information needs to be there. Now, let me point out two things really quickly with regards to your telephone number and regards to your email address. I'll start with email address. The handle of your email address should be something that is professional, okay? You do not want to use an email address where your handle is something cutesy um, or artsy or something that just is completely inappropriate in a professional setting. Okay, think about your email address. You would be amazed at how often this happens, right? It diminishes your credibility if your email address um, is not professional. So how do you create a professional email address? Well, that's easy. All you have to do is let your handle be some variation of your first and last name. And so, for example, I'm Denisha Smith. And so my email address might be dsmith. 27 at gmail.com. I'm just making this up. That is actually not my email address. Or it could be 
Denisha dot Denisha dot Smith at yahoo.com right um, Smith Denisha 2000 right some variation of your first and last name D Smith whatever Smith Denisha you know whatever and so you want it to be some variation of your first and last name that's usually a safe bet your first and last name with some numbers if you need to put numbers in there okay but nothing cutesy nothing that would be polarizing nothing that would make you look unprofessional all right with your phone number a lot of times the hiring process can take a long time so if you've ever had a job before and you've had to wait to hear back from someone after you've submitted an application or a resume it seems like it takes forever if you hear back at all right um, what you don't want to do though is forget that you have applied for a job and so you want to make sure that whenever you answer the phone that you try your best to sound professional or at least coherent <laughs> Okay, so sometimes I call people and they sound like the last thing on earth they wanted to do was answer the phone. The last thing on earth they wanted to do was wake up, right? And so I understand sometimes, especially if you're working like a third shift and you're trying to take an online class and you're trying to fit everything into your life and your schedule, you could be tired and when the phone rings, you may be asleep. But you kind of want to be mindful that you need to be... Um, in your most professional mode possible because that call could be a call from your prospective employer asking for an interview okay and you don't want to create a bad impression by the way you sound also you don't want to create a bad impression with any ringback tones or with an unprofessional um, or inappropriate outgoing message which is part of the reason why I asked you for your voicemail assignment to make sure you have um, a really good outgoing message for the duration of this class okay um, and so keep those things in mind with regards to the contact information now another section that used to be standard that now may be going away a little bit is career objective okay I want you to consider career objective as still a very important part of the resume and I want you to make sure that you have an objective or career objective okay they're one and the same objective career objective and so the career objective is a statement that you're going to craft about who you are and why you're qualified for the job who you are as a professional and why you're qualified for the job this statement isn't necessarily easy to craft the book talks about focused and unfocused objective statements to help you make sure that you are creating a focused statement um, but one thing that will help you is determining your job search right so again the first thing you need to do is find a job because that job and the requirements that they're looking for will drive what you put in your resume and what you put in your cover letter and so what I want you to do is I want you to create a career objective statement that includes a mention of that job posting title and a mention of the company okay a mention of the job posting title and a mention of the company so let's say you are applying for a position as a substitute teacher let's just say for example um, at a middle school okay and let's say you previously have worked in education before let's say you have five years experience in education let's say you're currently at OC Tech pursuing an early childhood um, degree okay let's just give us that scenario alright and so let's say XYZ company I'm sorry, not XYZ Company, XYZ Middle School is looking for a substitute teacher. What you can possibly say in your career objective is I am a trained um, educator with five years experience seeking the substitute teacher position at XYZ Middle School. Okay, that's a start at least. Okay, but do you see what we're doing? We're incorporating the job posting title and then also the name of the company in that career objective statement now you can continue to work on that statement and add more to it right um, you can maybe take away I am and maybe you can use one of those action verbs right experienced educator that's even better right seeking the substitute teacher position at XYZ middle school where I want to offer my compassionate caring service to the middle school population 
right? Something along those lines, right? And this is just coming off the top of my head. So just, it's, it's something along those lines. You want to just kind of craft a statement that is true to who you are and what you have to offer, but you want to include the name of the job posting and the name of the company. So why do you want to do that? I'm glad you asked, okay? You want to do that because you want to customize your resume for that specific job opening. Now trust me, I understand. There are times in life when we're casting a broad net and we're trying our hardest to get some company to notice us, right? So we may be applying to just about every job that seems relevant, okay? And that's fine. But the prospective employer wants to feel like you want to be at that job specifically. You want to be employed right there at XYZ Middle School, right? Not at JKL Middle School. You want to be at XYZ Middle School. And so they want to feel like you want to be there. And when you customize your resume and your cover letter, um, it gives that added emphasis that, you know what, I want to be employed here. You could very well be casting a wide net and looking in a lot of places, but you want to customize those documents specifically to that specific job opening. Okay? All right, so let's look at a couple of other things. Credentials is what the book calls it, and that includes your education and your experience. Okay, um, and so of course you want to make sure that you list your education. Sometimes students will forget to mention OC Tech, and I don't understand why. Um, but you want to make sure you include OC Tech, right? You will tell us that you are anticipating your degree, right? Anticipated. Um, graduation, right? And to say that you're currently a student and you're working toward that goal. Um, with your education, you want to make sure that you list your information in reverse chronological order. So that means you start with wherever you are right now and then you work your way backward. You do not want to start at your very first ed educational experience and work your way up to the present. You want to start at the present and work your way backward. Okay, the same is true with experience. You want to start at your most um, recent job or your current job, and then you want to list everything relevant for that. Okay, and so those are some of the things that you want to do. Okay, and so now with education, you want to make sure that you're mentioning your program that you're in, um, and you can also include the coursework, just maybe a sentence or two that indicates the type of coursework that you have had in college. That's important because that indicates the training that you've received to prepare you for your field. Okay, with education, not, excuse me, not education, but with experience, your job history is important for many employers, right? They want to know where you've worked. Um, they want to know the kind of training you've received. That matters. Now, what you want to do, like I said, is work backward. You want to begin at what's most current and work your way back. But what if you've never had a job before? right? You're in school probably to get a job. And so if you've never had a job before, or if you're changing careers, um, and if you just, you know, maybe have had some gaps in your employment history, you may be kind of nervous about this assignment and about the job market, but don't be, because we're going to talk in just a second about organizing your resume, and one of our options should help you, okay? So stay tuned for that. Um, but it's important that you provide when you're talking about your experience, if you have that experience, that you provide a short description, okay, one or two lines of your duties and achievements. That's really important. Okay, it'll let me highlight it, so I'll highlight it. Okay, and so um, provide that description. You don't want to just say what your job title was. You want to emphasize your responsibilities, okay? You want to emphasize your responsibilities. So for example, the book gives us a great one. You help set up a chemistry lab, ordering supplies and keeping an inventory of them. Rather than saying you were an administrative assistant, indicate that you wrote business letters and use various software programs, maintain records, design a company website, prepared schedules for part-time help in an office of 25 people, or assisted the manager in preparing minutes, accounts, and presentations. Okay? What you did will always be much more interesting than your simple job title alone. Okay? And so keep those things in mind. Related skills and achievements, okay? And so it's good to include those things as well. Employers are looking for a well-rounded candidate usually. And so let us know if you speak a second or a third language, okay? Um, or if you have a certificate or a license, okay? Let us know that. Um, or if you have a membership in a professional association, okay? Let us know that as well. And so 
All of those things are important. The memberships and professional associations and the certificates and licenses could afford you opportunities for networking, which we talked about in the other video. Um, but you want to let us know that because it shows an initiative on your part, especially when those certificates or licenses or memberships are related to the field that you're seeking the job in. Okay, and so that's really good. Also, memberships and community service groups. Okay, computer skills, of course, you want to mention those. Any honors and awards that you receive, definitely put them down, especially if they're relevant. Okay, now if it's something that is not relative, relevant, or if it's just tongue in cheek and it's just not going to make you look professional, then you want to leave those out. But typically, if it's an honor or an award you receive, make sure you mention that. Now, I'm going to talk about the references section, okay? I'm going to highlight this in, well, it didn't work. I was going to highlight it in pink. Let's see if it'll work this time. Nope, it didn't. Okay. Well, I want you to make sure that you pay attention to references, okay? References is very important, okay? It's going to go at the very end of your resume. It's going to be the last section that I expect to see on your resume, your references section, okay? So there was a day in time when you were supposed to list the contact information for your references on your resume. You were supposed to put the individual's names and contact information on your resume. Now that has changed. So you should not list references with personal contact information on your resume. You don't want to put that on your resume. Instead, you just want to say that your references are available on request. That is what you want to say. You want to say that your references are available on request. So the very last section of your resume should be your references. And underneath that section, what you want to write is references are available upon request. Okay? References are available upon request. Now, here's the key. This only works if you have asked references for permission to be references, right? You never want to put that down there thinking that you have time to find references. You want to find the references before you put the information down, right? Even if you're just saying references are available on request. So what does that mean? You found this great job. You want to apply for it. Um, you're getting all of your materials together. At that point in time, contact your references, three to five people, and ask their permission. Ask them if they're willing to be a reference for you, to give you an enthusiastic reference for this specific job that you're applying for. In the other video, we talked about some things, right? You may need to send them your resume so that you bring them up to speed on what you've been up to. Um, you may need to remind them of who you are. You may need to craft a letter, okay? Regardless of what you need to do, um, you definitely want to make sure that you ask that permission. You don't ever want to be in a situation where you have put on your resume that references are available upon request and a recruiter or someone from Human Resources contacts you and says, you know what, we are interested in taking you further in the hiring process, can you produce your references so that we can contact them? At that point, you don't want to have to go back and ask people for permission. You want to already have those references set up, okay? So when you ask someone to be a reference for you, make sure that they send you um, their preferred contact information so that when you're asked for your references, you can just go ahead and give those to that prospective employer, okay? Does that make sense? All right, and so let's just keep on moving here. So that pretty much, um, oh no, organizing your resume. I did say we were going to talk about that. And so organizing your resume is very important, okay? Um, there are two primary ways to organize your resume. One is chronologically, and the other is by function or skill area, okay? Both of those become important. And so the chronological resume is traditional, it's typical, it's the type we always see, okay? Um, and so it's straightforward, it's easy to read, and with the chronological resume, essentially, if you have been working consistently in your field and you've had very little to no gaps in your employment, you probably want to use the chronological option, okay? This option is going to emphasize your work experience. It's going to emphasize that you have been consistently employed or you've been consistently employed in your field, okay? And so that's usually what people want to use um, if they have had little to no gaps in their employment history. But maybe you haven't had a job before, or maybe you've taken time off of work to go back to school, or maybe you've taken time off of work to start a family, okay? All of those things are valid, or maybe you just have been unemployed for a while. 
And so you may want to then use a function or skill area organization for your resume. In this type of resume, you're not going to emphasize your experience, of course, because you may not have as much experience as you would want to have. Okay, And so instead, you're going to emphasize your skill area. That's it. That's what's going to be prominent in your resume. Okay. And when I say prominent, I mean higher up in the resume. So you'll have your contact information with your name and informa your name and contact. Then you'll have your objective statement. And then after that, you may go right on into your skill area. Okay. And the book gives us some titles here that we could possibly use. You should select two to four titles or, or headings, subheadings from this list or from others that you might come up with and then categorize your skills okay and the book gives us a good example around page 130 185 I believe um, an example of a skills resume okay and so you want to focus on the skills that you've earned now not all experience is paid experience so you may have experience from things like organizing a household budget um, maybe leading um, a Girl Scout troop. It could be a variety of different things. Maybe you've been a babysitter. That takes a lot of skill, right? Um, because you have to make sure that you are attention, you have attention to detail, that um, you're watching the children, that you're organized, right? That you're keeping up with them. There's a whole lot of skill that can go in that. And so it's okay if you've never had a job. You just have to now think about how you can market the skills that you do have, okay? And so those are the two ways you can organize your resume chronologically mainly emphasizing your education and work experience um, or by function or skill area where you're going to emphasize your skill more so than your experience okay and so let's keep moving and I'm just going to keep on zooming through some of these other parts that I'm actually not going to talk about and we're going to make our way over to the letter of application okay and so what is a letter of application well we call it a cover letter and I like to say that your cover letter is your first conversation with your prospective employer okay it's your first conversation it's a conversation on paper but it's still your first conversation it's where you're going to introduce yourself and where you're going to talk to that prospective employer about why you are the best candidate so whereas the resume is not written in complete sentences is using phrases and action verbs the cover letter will be written as a letter so you're going to write it in complete sentences you can use ABC format for your cover letter where you have that abstract beginning the body with all the details and then the goodwill closing in that conclusion okay and you want to make sure that you're following the correct letter format as well and so um, a lot of times prospective employers will ask applicants to send in um, a cover letter as well. And so your cover letter should be per personable, professional, and persuasive. Personable, professional, and persuasive. Okay? And so um, the book talks about how resumes and cover letters differ. I won't go back to that. And so it also talks about writing the letter of application and it gives us some examples. Okay, Again, you want to follow the standard conventions of writing a letter. You want to supply all the contact information as part of your heading. You can create a letterhead for yourself if you want using Microsoft Word. If you go to insert in Microsoft Word, you can insert a header. And it usually gives you some options like templates that you can use and customize to kind of create your own letterhead. You could do that. You want to make sure your letter is attractive just like your resume and you want to make sure you're sending your letter to a specific person so let's just say because this happens all the time let's just say your job search doesn't give you a name of an individual okay well you may need to do a little bit of research you may need to go on the company's website to see if you can find a name um, um, and you may need to um, see if you can find information about who has actually posted the job okay so going on the company's website is usually helpful if all else fails and this may be contrary to what the book tells you if all else fails you can say dear hiring manager you could address it to the hiring manager and I think it's fine to say dear director of human resources okay if you don't have another name but if you do have a name you definitely want to make sure you spell it correctly okay some people are very sensitive about their spelling but as a good communicator you want to make sure you do that anyway okay um, don't send a form letter to every potential employer you want to customize it 
again you want to mention that actual job title from the job posting and the name of the company in that abstract paragraph and I'm, I've given you an example of a cover letter um, in this week's content and it's a good example because on one page it's the actual job posting it's something I actually found um, a couple of months ago and I created this cover letter with this fictitious person and it's trying to respond to what the prospective employer is looking for so that file hopefully will be a good guide for you to figure out um, you know how you can respond to the job posting in that cover letter okay be concise emphasize you attitude okay make sure you are talking about um, the employers needs and not focus as much on your needs but you definitely want to tell them who you are okay and make sure it is a good letter right don't be content to just slap something together and throw it out there it will diminish your credibility okay so the book gives you more information as well about what you can put in those respective sections of the paragraphs a lot of this is really 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 good information okay so if you have questions after watching this video after reading what the textbook offers please don't hesitate to contact me. I would be more than happy to offer more insight how I can. And hopefully this has been helpful. Have a great day.